a long time. Okay, so I've broken it down, and I will go over some of the, of the passages, but if anything, this is basically Moses' burning bush experience. Okay, so we're just going to go and look at that. And I'll be reading from Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, very brief. I want you to, we're going to take a look at this, and then of course I'll, I'll jump around the Bible, and if you are taking notes, I'll try to reference those scriptures for you. Amen? Let's go ahead and read. It says, and those of you that are my guests, I usually put it up on the big screen so you can follow along. It says, now Moses was uh, tending the flock of Je uh, Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames of the fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, for just a wonderful time of your presence. Thank you for blessing us this morning. Thank you for the presence of your people this morning. And Father, as we end this series of new creations, I pray, Lord Jesus, that your people's hearts will be open and their minds will be focused solely on you, Lord, the author and perfecter of our faith. Remind us, Lord, as we are all new creations, all of us have made a profession of faith we have asked you, Lord. We have begged you, Lord. Some of us have cried out to you to come into our lives, Lord. Make us white as snow. Forgive us of all our sins, Lord. And we are reminded of all the characters in the Bible, Lord, who have had a strange life, Lord, that were considered enemies of God. But somehow, Lord, through your great love, you came into their lives. It is by grace that we have been saved, not of anything that we have done. So, Father, I pray as you hide me behind your precious cross this morning and impart your truths to your people. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everybody says, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Go ahead. Turn. Wow, you guys look good out there. Turn to the neighbor and say, You look good. You guys can say that. If I was going to watch, you could say you look good. It's a little affirmation. A number of points this morning from this this wonderful story, so that you'll you'll see. And, and as I'm kind of imparting these these points, I'm reminding you that it's a large it's a large story where you have to read where God gives Moses instruction, and as He gives Moses instruction, Moses has to think along those instructions and respond to those instructions. So that's why this this the story of Moses is is a long story. But those of you that just follow along and you know I don't know how many times I have read this passage and I captured something here that I had never captured in my studies about uh, Moses' story but I'm, remind, I'm reminded of this this was an extraordinary day for Moses and that's my first point it was an extraordinary day and how many of us can say I've had an extraordinary day go ahead and raise your hand an extraordinary day meaning you, you know that there was a God presence in your life and we've all experienced those. An extraordinary day, it takes on a, a special meaning. And, and it's a meaning that forever changes your life. The way something that radically changes your way you think, your attitude, your behavior, the way you live life. This was going to be an extraordinary day. And in verse 2 it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flames. And I, I have that one, those three or four words underlined, the angel of the Lord. That, there's a big Bible word called a theophany. It's, it means it's a, an appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. It reminds us of, of, of those of us that have had uh, a, a, I'll call it a, a presence that we know was good. 
Sometimes when I was a brand new Christian, I could I almost sense that there was something with me, and, and it was almost like when I was praying that God had his hand on my shoulder. Now, that may sound kind of weird to some of you, but the back of my ears felt like, you know, the hairs on the back of my hairs were standing, and I'm thinking, is that you, God? Now, don't say, Pastor Ben, are you, are you okay? <laughs> Because I'm reminding you that all of us, God intervenes in all of our lives in different ways. And he minister us, ministers to us in, in very different ways because we're all different people. And this was just a, a, a very new beginning for me to try to understand how God operates in my own personal life. And it was through my prayers, being a very young Christian, not knowing how to see God, not knowing really how to pray to God, just learning to talk to God. And... Even in my very youthful time as a Christian, I, those of you that are brand new in the Lord, you're probably saying, well, I don't know how to really pray so that you understand. The, the, the disciples, the followers of Jesus in the very beginning, they didn't even know how to pray. In fact, they asked God. They told Jesus, Master, teach us how to pray. They didn't even know what prayer was. They, they had us some essence. And they probably had seen some of the rabbis pray, but those... They're so far removed from how you can pray. And I'm reminding you as we sang this song called, I am a friend of God. It is a friendship that you have, earthly friendships that, that you have with one another. And the type of conversations that you have with your friends, and I'm not saying you're gonna have the same conversation with God, but it's that type of relationship that you share with your friends that you should be open and honest and be able to just have this running dialogue between your friends, God relishes that type of relationship with us. Where we can just talk to God and be open to God. And, and it's in our prayer life that I could just be a young kid back that was raised on South Grant Street, not knowing really how to pray, but just being myself. You know, sometimes we think that we have to learn to pray and communicate to God in such a religious manner, if you will, almost reverential, where we say, Thou God, you're the greatest of all gods, and you don't have to be that way. You could just say, God, are you there? Can, can you hear me, God? And you just be yourself. Nobody, there is no real format to say that you have to be eloquent in your prayers to God. Be yourself. Be familiar with God. Just be comfortable with God. But the, the, but the greatest thing about praying is that I've learned, learn to be quiet too. <laughs> I have a hard time being quiet because I'm a real shy person. <laughs> Thank you. Learning to be quiet and learning to listen to God. And that's the thing because you know, when you have needs, we all have needs, right? So we always go before God. God, I need this. God, something else has happened. God, can you do this, 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 and this? Can you give me that, that, that? I mean, God is bombarded by these requests from you. Now, after you, because come on, if you're talking to somebody, you just say, hey, uh, you know, how are you doing? And you say a few words, and then you let them respond, right? But if you're always the one, I know there are some of you have great conversations with your family and you're the one doing all the talking, right? And then when you're done on the phone, you say, okay, bye. They didn't even get a chance to say anything. That's not a conversation. And that's how some of us talk to God. We tell God what we want and we want God to do this and do that. Can you do that? And then we say, okay, thank you, bye. And God's trying to teach us. And this is a, this is a dialogue between the angel of the Lord or again, a theophany where God is present and he appeared to Moses in a flame, and, and that burning bush is an, a wonderful, uh, uh, awesome sight. And I was having this dialogue with my wife as I was reading this, because it says here, Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. Now, how many of you saw this? See, I tried to put myself in that same situation. What if you saw this? Every day, every day that Moses was in the desert tending the flock, it was the same, same old, same old. He finally comes upon a burning bush in his, I guess he's, his trending or whatever he's doing there, and he sees something that is consumed by flames. And this is the description that he gives. 
And I'm saying as Moses, so verse 3 says, so Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight and why the bush, bush does not burn up. And I'm saying when I'm reading this, don't do it. Don't do it. I mean, he doesn't know. Again, this is an extraordinary day that's going to take place. It's already extraordinary because he sees something that he has never seen before. He knows it's a bush. He knows it's on fire, but it's not consumed. It's not burnt up. And he can't help. Am I talking too loud? So he can't help but wonder, what is this thing? And I'm saying, don't do it. And he goes anyway. Moses goes and he entertains and tries to figure out what has happened. And the Bible tells us that Moses is a very humble man. And you don't know the story of Moses. Moses, again, God's hand was on his, his life from the very beginning because he was supposed to be killed. Okay? Exterminated. And uh, reading his story, I'm not going to tell you his story, but you're gonna, you have to read it yourself. It's kind of like, I've already kind of introduced the story to you. It's kind of like a movie. You're watching a movie, but I don't get to tell you what happened at the end, right? And you go, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, sometimes I'll even show you a video clip and you want to watch the rest of it, but I've only given you three minutes of it. Well, if you're curious, read the story, okay? So Moses is a very humble man. He's a humble shepherd and he's tending Jethro's flock. And there is something that's gonna take place, and that's why I call it an extraordinary day. Because he's gonna have an encounter with God, and God's gonna set his life ablaze. He's gonna be on fire for God, and that's what we want, amen? We all wanna be on fire for God, amen? And you guys aren't, you aren't convincing me. You wanna be on fire for God, right? So in other words, those of you that were here last Sunday, that in itself was a burning bush. Amen? You've all experienced this. And when you're on fire for God, you want to do things for God. You're excited for the things of God and, and everything that is involved with God. You want to be where, where the people of God are. And Moses is going to experience this. And for some reason, and I know this through his life, that that fire in Moses' life is never going to be quenched. Because he's going to have an extraordinary day and God is going to set his life ablaze. He's going to be on fire for God and he will never be the same. Because the fire that God places on his life will not be quenched. Oh man, I want that. I think I already have that, but I'm excited. I mean, for those of you that don't know what that feels like, it's, it's exciting. Because you're not afraid. You just do things. I mean, it's almost like impromptu, even when you're you're saying that you're on, on fire for God, you're ablaze of God, and all of a sudden you see this perfect stranger, you're sitting next to him, and all of a sudden God prompts you, says, why don't you share my life with him? And of course, my flesh says, I don't want to bother God. I don't even know the guy. The next thing you know, God just kind of tells me, come on, you can do this. So I'll tell him, hey, wait for your tires to get rotated, a small talk, right? And then from that point, just tell him, you're a football fan? You know, I just gotta find common ground, right? I usually find guys that don't like football. <laughs> Makes me wanna cry. <laughs> you know? It's kinda like, God, come on, try to make this easy. I don't even care if he's a 49er or a Denver Bronco fan. That's okay. Because God loves them too. Okay? I'm good with that. I'm good with that. Okay? But, but God has set this man's life ablaze. And it says this, and it's important for us to understand this in verse 5. It says that God speaks to Moses and tells him, Take off your sandals, for the ground that you stand on is holy. And and, and this is an understanding of humility. It tells us in verse 6 that from doing that, Moses bowed before God. And it's a reminder to us that everything of God should be reverenced. Amen? Moses understood this. And we as his people, we should understand that too. You know, I, I know we're casual. You say, well, Pastor Ben, you're, 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 you're wearing a, a Raider jersey in the household of God. Don't we reverence? It's not the external. Let's get something straight. 
It's inside. Because I don't need to be wearing an Armani, Armani suit every Sunday to tell you that I love God. Because there are a lot of church people here and all throughout the world that on the outside they look like church people, but on the inside they're far from God. Oh, come on, church. You know what I'm talking about? So it's not what you look like on the, because we can be deceived. There are a lot of people that look like church, and they, some of them may even speak like church, and some may somehow manage to act like church, but their lives are far from God. See, and it's important for you to understand that when you think of Moses, there was something about Moses that God wanted, and, and when God entered his life, his life from that day forward was going to be extraordinary. Amen? So I, I think about his humility and, and understand something, that this burning bush, it, it is, it's a picture to me when I think about the burning bush and you're saying, Pastor Ben, what is the significance of that burning bush? It's a reminder to us that from the very beginning of the Bible times, there were a, a lot of leaders who tried to eradicate Israel. From Pharaoh, we know that the story of Egypt, we know that Pharaoh tried to just demolish all of the Jews or the Israelites at that time. And God's, his hand is on his people. And it's something that we, you know, we had our Bible study at, when we were at Lakebrook. And I, I remember in our Bible study when we were at Lakebrook, we asked a question when we read through the book of Galatians. That the book of Galatians speaks of God's chosen people. And I said, why couldn't God's chosen people be any other ethnicity or nationality? Why, why did it have to be the Jews? And I couldn't answer that because the bottom line is God is sovereign. God can choose whatever he wants and do whatever he wants because God reminds him, where were you when I created the world? Who were you when I created the Pacific and the Atlantic and the Mediterranean and all these other seas? God can be sovereign and because God is sovereign, he could do whatever he wants. And he chose the Jews to be his chosen people. But that shouldn't uh, the, discourage us because guess what? He loves Gentiles just the same because we are grafted in. And because we are adopted children of God, we are also those of the redeemed. Amen? Amen should go there. Amen? Amen should go there, church. Amen? You're not allowed to be quiet today. This is football Sunday. I'm getting you all excited for your game. You know? Let me use the analogy that my sister didn't really say. Those of you that are wearing your football jerseys, you understand that when you watch your football game and you're watching your team progress down the field, the ultimate goal of your team is to score a touchdown. So when your, your team finally scores and you, the announcer on the TV or on the radio or wherever you're listening to the game, and you hear your announcer says that he goes up, he catches the ball, put two feet down on the ground, touchdown, you get all excited, right? Some of you jump off your sofas. Some of you get so crazy that we don't even know who you are. You do. You get, I get like that. In fact, if you ever watch, come watch me, watch any sporting event in my house, I stand up in front of the TV. I block the TV. That's why we got a big screen. So there's... I'm just using this analogy to remind you, if you is, are a fanatical about your team and you get excited when your team does something great, when you're in the household of faith, when you're here in the presence of God, when you're amongst believers that believe that Jesus Christ came, was lived amongst us, was crucified, suffered, and died, and on the third day rose from the grave victorious, the same God that brought you out of whatever sin that you were involved in and brought you into his wonderful life is the same God that you should worship and get excited about. Yeah. So when somebody talks about your God and says these wonderful things about your God and says God is this and God is great and God is awesome, you shouldn't say like when your team scores a touchdown, oh, they scored. <laughs> because I know that's not the way you respond. In the same way, when your God is victorious, and you know your God is victorious, God tells us that we're more than conquerors. We win. So it's a reminder to us, because of that one extraordinary day that took place in your life, 
You should get excited about God's every move, every breath. I should have to tell you guys, come on, calm down, calm down. No, I don't think you guys need that right now. But it's a reminder to us that all these individuals, from Pharaoh to Nebuchadnezzar to Hitler to Saddam, all these individuals have tried and they failed miserably because the burning bush will not be consumed. Amen? And it's a reminder to us that the Bible even tells us that God put a blessing on any nation that is good to Israel and a curse to those who treat Israel badly. So it's a reminder to us when you pray for our leaders and you pray for our nation, that you pray that the, the leaders of our nation will always say, let's make sure we have Israel's back because those are God's chosen people. As long as our nation has their back, we're gonna be okay as a nation. But as soon as we turn our back on Israel, cursed is the nation that neglects them. And you know, some of us don't know that about the Bible, but it's a reminder to us that our nation will go through some hard times as long as our leaders turn a blind eye to the things of Israel. Amen? That's in the Bible. You need to, that's not Pastor Ben. That's a Bible thing. And God reminds us of all the people that have tried their hardest to do something or eradicate the people of God there in Israel. Let me read this part, portion to you. It's Deuteronomy chapter 33. It says, with the best gifts of the earth and its fullness. And then I want you to read this. It says this, and the favor of him who was God, who dwelt in the burning bush. The reminder that God was in the burning bush. Amen? In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, it says, for our God is a consuming fire. Amen? However you want to interpret that, it's a reminder to us that God, he's in us. Greater is he that is in me, in you, than he that is in God is a consuming fire. And because God is in us, it is that fire that can never be quenched. It's that fire that gets us going and moves us. It lets us know that wherever we go, we should set somebody ablaze. Not literally ablaze, but something about our lives. People should recognize that there is something different about you. In other words, when you, when you enter a room, people should notice that there is something different about you. I.e. what we just talked about last Sunday. I was once a certain individual, but because of what Jesus Christ has done in my life, I'm not that person anymore. And people should recognize that there is a significant change in your life. Amen? I'm moving on. So we go from an extraordinary day to an extraordinary announcement. Okay? I'm going to read this passage real quick. It says, The Lord said, I have indeed, and look at the words, I, I, I've kind of highlighted certain words. The Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and bring them out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land born with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Pezzarites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And when I was a kid, I used to include mosquito bites. Okay? Excuse that. And then verse 9, and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. And then it says, verse 10, so this is the great announcement, so that you'll see this. Moses knows all this that God has spoken to him through the burning bush. Moses knows this. He knows that these, these Egyptians are oppressing he as a Jew, Jew now, Hebrew, he knows this. Bad things are happening to his people, but he has run away, and he's in the encampment of Jethro, basically hiding out. And he comes in and confronts God, and God tells him, I've seen this. I've heard this, and I'm concerned. I know all this. But verse 10, because Moses is all excited, he's saying, wow, God knows all these things that are happening to our people. And He's going to do something about it. Because look at, this is where I was talking about earlier where I did not capture this. Verse 8, it says, 
So I have come down. Wow. God says he's going to come down and take care of this mess. God says he's going to come down and take care of the oppression that the Egyptians are, going to, are doing to his people. But in verse 10 it says, so now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. So God said, here Moses says, great, you're coming down, you're going to take care of this. No, Moses, I'm, I'm going to be with you, but you're going to go. I'm sending you. You're going to take care of this mess. I'll tell you right now. That's why I said, don't go. Don't, <laughs> you're curious about that burning bush. But don't go. And Moses was so curious that he had to. His day was going to change forever because of this extraordinary announcement. I know, Moses, everything that is on your heart. I know that the people of God are crying out. They need help. They need this, their lives to be changed dramatically. I understand the cries and the, and the torment and everything that they're being oppressed about. And I'm going to be, and I'm going to come down and I'm going to take care of that. Moses is excited. But God tells Moses, but I'm going to send you to take care of that. And it's a reminder to us as a church that there are people in the church. You know what? I, I hear this all the time as pastors. We need this. How many of us? I'm not. Don't raise your hand because I, I don't. I don't want to. But how many of us? You just need to think of this. This is Moses. There are so many needs in the church, and you're saying we need. We need. At our, our ministry team meetings, we all say we need more people to help in children's church. We need. We need. We need. We need. Pastor Ben wants. That to be renewed right there. See that? That's, that looks new for some of you, right? That, that nice, nice screen? We bought that back in 2004. We bought that when that first, first came out because we used to use these things called transparencies. <laughs> that was old school. And some, some people didn't have good penmanship. <laughs> Did I just say that? <laughs> well, some people didn't. And they would write last minute, and we would try to sing through this transparency, and you're thinking, what word is that? <laughs> but we've elevated our, our tools, so we have nice toys now. But that is obsolete now. Because Pastor Ben has visited other churches. Let me say that real quick. Pastor Ben has visited other churches, and I have coveted what they have. I know we're not supposed to covet, but I told God, I want that. And it's, they're just new things, new toys, new things for ministry. Again, my heart is good, my intentions are good because I see what we have. Don't get me wrong, I love what we have and what God has blessed me with. Like you have nice cars, but when you see another car, you say, you're in a new car. You just rolled out of the parking lot with your new car. And you're driving down the street in your new car, and another car drives by you, and you go, oh, that's a nice car. <laughs> We're like that. And I'm no different. And it's a reminder to us that here was Moses. Moses understood that there was some really bad things taking place, and he wanted things solved. And God says, you know those things, and I know those things. And I'm going to send you. You're going to take care of those things. Amen? And unfortunately, that's the bad thing. Moses did not want to take care of these things. God, Moses wanted God to take care of these things. And God told him, I'm coming down and I'm going to help you take care of these things. But you're going to be the man that's going to take care of things. And it's a reminder to us in the church. Many of us know that there are things in the church that need to be done. But we want other people to do them for us. We get excited. You know, one of the busiest days that we have, just before convention, we call it church cleanup day. Because, you know what? I'm not being mean. 
But church people, we get dirty sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Don't throw rocks at me, okay? We do, because we, as long as you're going to occupy your father's house, this is God's house. We, we kind of dirty it up. So just before our big convention, we have something called church cleanup. And you know, so it makes me wonder, because when we come maybe two Sundays after church cleanup, we always tell the congregation, oh, we want to thank all of you. We want to thank all those that came out and participated in church cleanup. And those of you that didn't miss out on the opportunity, you look around and you go, wow, the church looks really nice. Wow, I even like the way the, the nice flowers are out and the grass is trimmed and everything, the sidewalk is sweeped and the lines are drawn on the dirt out there and everything, there's no, no dust everywhere, Every, cobwebs are gone. Wow, everything looks great. But when I say, I want to thank all of you that participated, you're quiet. Everybody else is clapping because they were part of it. I want you to be part of that. All of us should be intricate parts, and we're all part of the body of Christ. And because we're all part of the body of Christ, all of us have an intricate part of serving in some capacity. And that means rolling up your sleeves and sometimes vacuuming. Because you know what? I vacuum. I'm pastor, I still vacuum, and some people look at me when I'm vacuuming, they go, Pastor, don't be vacuuming. I vacuum in my own house, right? Some of us need to wash dishes. Washing dishes is therapeutic. No? Well, that's why they created dishwashers. <laughs> we are the dishwashers. But Moses was given this extraordinary announcement and God was going to speak to him. And God told him, I'm going to send you. And Moses said, no, 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 no. I, 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 I see that, but I don't want anything part of that. Amen. And, and, and we're seeing the transformation of a man where God says, I'm, I'm giving you this assignment. And that's on my next thing. An extraordinary excitement, uh, assignment. And Moses' response, and, and I love this. I want you, we're going to read these together because um, this is God's dialogue with Moses, and this is Moses' response to God. Verse 11 says, when God tells him, I'm going to send you, Moses says to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Who am I? We're all the same. Who am I to help teach children's church? I don't know the Bible that well. Who am I to, to help sweep the, the, the driveway? I don't even know how to pick up a broom. I mean, some of us, we just don't, who am I to teach? I don't even know how to teach. If you're, if you're a living person, you know how to teach. How many of you know how to tie your shoes? If you have Velcro, then you still have to learn, okay? But if you know how to tie your shoelaces, then you know how to teach. So nobody doesn't have the ability to teach. And Moses says in verse 13 to God, he says, Suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, What is his name? What shall I tell them? Another excuse. They're not going to believe me. And this running dialogue reminds us of this. God, if you have not read this story, it's incredible. God tells Moses, what is in your hand? And Moses, being a shepherd, had a staff, a shepherd's staff. And God tells Moses, throw it on the ground. So he throws it on the ground, and it turns into a snake. So it turns into a snake, and now he says, now grab its tail. So Moses grabs its tail, and boom, it resumes back to a staff. And he goes, that's the first sign. And then Moses says, well, that's a nice trick. So then God tells Moses, if they don't believe that, then stick your hand in your cloak. So Moses sticks his hands in his cloak, and as he sticks his hands in the cloak, he pulls it out. His hand is leprous. It's white as snow. And he tells him, if that doesn't work, he puts it back in his, his, his uh, hand back in his cloak and brings it back out, and it's totally restored. So God is showing Moses, if they don't believe that, though just your word saying that you have this authority, I'm going to show you these signs in which they will believe you. 
And then, of course, the last thing is, if they don't believe those, I want you to go to the Nile and get a pitcher of water from the Nile. And as you show the people and you pour it on the ground, the water from the pitcher from the Nile will turn to blood. It's a constant reminder to us that there will always have people that doubt, that don't believe. But God is reminding us, even in our great assignments, don't be like Moses. You know, where God guides, he provides. And where God directs, he protects. And where God sends, he extends. Amen? So God is, God is never going to tell you to go somewhere or do something if he's not going to be there to provide for you the means. Amen? So Moses says in, in verse 10, he says, Moses said the Lord... And he's very reverent. He says, pardon your servant, Lord, but I've never been great of speech. I'm not eloquent. I, he's just reminding me of, I'm slow of speech. So I, I'm not a good speaker. And it's a reminder to us that we are always going to have excuses not to serve in some capacity to God. And all of us, we all like to talk. Amen? Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. We all like to talk. Right? And I'm talking a lot. We all like to talk. It's a reminder to us that all of us have the ability to communicate. We all have the ability to share the love of God. And, and it's a reminder to us, don't ever allow that to be quenched in your life. Share what God has done in your life. And then, of course, I, this is the most perfect excuse. Everybody does this. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. <laughs> Are you kidding me? You know what? I don't know. But I'm thinking, if I'm before God, I, again, I like to put myself there. I don't know if God told me I'm sending you, and then I don't know if that, that is even reverent enough part of your servant, Lord, but please send somebody else. After all those other excuses and God always has a response, I will be with you, I will provide for you, don't worry about what other people say, I'll show you these powerful signs and wonders that will be with you when you do this, and then at the end, after God tells you, I will be with you 24-7 as you're engaging Pharaoh and your people, and then you turn around and tell God, please send someone else. I don't know about that. I think I'd be a little scared to tell God that after everything that he has done for me and shown me, amen? It should be a reminder to us because this one passage, I remember sharing this in, in Hawaii at one of the conventions because we were talking about, yes, we can. Yes, I can, amen? And it's Philippians 4.13. It says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Who can? Oh, that's weak. Who can? I so you, we as a people of God, of a body of Christ, when, when somebody asks you, can you do this? None of us should ever have the response like Moses and say, well, show me a sign that I'm able to do this. You know, I don't know. I, I'm not really good. With, because I, I'm reminding you of a... Of a very dear friend of mine, when I first came into the ministry, I was just a young kid myself, young man myself, and this guy was so shy. I mean, barely high and, and you know, not much word. Very bright kid, though. Shy. His name was Jason Tagdera. I mean, he was shy. I remember we went to a... a we went to a camp together and we were coming back and I think it was a foster freeze. Or we were coming back and I, I was sitting next to him and I think I had a soft serve and I was trying to get him to talk to me, but he wouldn't talk to me. You know, he was like, I said, how did you think camp was? And he was just being, it was all right. It's all right. You know, very one worded and that was it. And I'm reminded now when I think of this verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It reminds me that all of us here that is in the body of Christ, all you have to be willing to say is, I can. 
I can do this. And with God's help, I can do all things. Amen? Nothing that is part of the body of Christ. Jason became a pastor. The shy young man became a pastor. In fact, I used to call him the Jericho Wall. Because he was, he, he was like the John Madden of pastors. I mean, he was not afraid. I mean, this, this boisterous can proclaim the word of God and no timidity in him. He was a guy that can proclaim the word of God and he still does it today. Amen. He's a very good friend of mine. And, and it's a reminder of us when we think of I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the call who hear and answers his voice. Let me say that again. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the call who hear and answer his voice. Amen. There are a number of people, in, in, so that you understand what I'm talking about. There are a number of people in the body of Christ, in the body of Christ, who are so equipped, they have all the knowledge in the world. And when I say all the knowledge of the world, they have the degrees up here. But for some reason, I don't know what it is. It makes me, it, it literally grieves me as a minister because I am, I'm the least of these and I'm not being humble. There are people that will run circles around me when it comes to the knowledge of God. But for some reason, they are not serving God in that capacity. It'd be no different if your mom sent you to be a doctor and she educated you as a doctor and you come out of there with a PhD and you work at, not that it's a bad thing, you decide you're gonna work at Kmart. And you're getting mad at all the doctors that aren't doing, and that's a bad thing too. You critique all the doctors that are not doing what they should be doing, but you're a doctor yourself. You're, a, you're an engineer. You critique the way to build the, the, the freeways, but you're working as a salesperson for some shoe company, but your, dad, your mom and dad sent you to be an engineer and spent thousands of dollars so that you could be educated in engineering. But all you do is critique those people that are not building things correctly. We have a lot of people that know the Bible, they know God frontwards and backwards, but for some apparent reason are not serving in that capacity. And that's why, and I'm reminded of this, God is not, he's not, he's the least interested in your education. He's more, in, he's more interested in your availability. The best availability is ability. Amen? God run, he wants us to understand that. You have the ability because Christ has going to, he's going to put what he needs in you. God's going to get more glory than for what you're doing, just like Moses. Moses doesn't have anything. Moses is ill-equipped to do anything. But God uses Moses in a mighty way. In a mighty way. And God gets the glory. Amen? I'm not putting down education. I think education is a great thing. But I'm here to remind you, because you do these things, please, don't forfeit that education. Put it to good use, amen? Put it to good use. We have so much talent in the body of Christ. And if you are educated, take that knowledge and, and bless the body of Christ with the knowledge that God has given you, amen? amen. I'm closing with this. Some of you are saying, well, Pastor Ben, you said the making of a mighty man of God. Well, Moses went through all this, these things and this assignment, there was no way he was going to do what God asked him to do. But somehow, some way he, in his eloquent or his, his voice not being eloquent enough, God told him to get your brother Aaron who will speak for you. Moses ended up being the spokesperson for the people of God. He rose up to the challenge. And on this night in Exodus chapter 12, Moses kept telling Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh, during this night in verse 31 of chapter 12, during the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, up, leave my people, you 
and the Israelites, go and worship the Lord as you have requested. Take your flocks and your herds as you have said and go and also bless me. You know what was amazing about this mass exodus of the Israelites through the leadership of Moses? The Bible says that they plundered, they plundered the Egyptians. They took gold and silver, livestock, everything. They took everything because the Egyptians were now at the mercy of God. So all of the Israelites were literally walking out of Egypt with all the resources, gold and silver, through the leadership of a man who told God, send somebody else. God can do all things through Christ who strengthens. We can do that, amen? And all we have to tell God is, send me, I'll do it. Just avail yourself to God and watch God move in your lives, amen? That's what I love about God. You know what? I always tell my wife, I didn't want to do what I was going to do. This, I didn't aspire to being who I am. I didn't wake up one morning and say, I'm going to be a pastor. I just ended up coming to church. And as I came to church, one thing led to another and another and another. And then I, I ended up um, confronting my burning bush, if you will. And God said, choose you this day who you're going to serve. And I said, I, I choose to serve the Lord. Amen. And so all of us, one way or another, you'll be confronted. And I pray as you are confronted and, and God has this extraordinary day for you and he tells you one of these things. He may tell you something very small and to accomplish that small task or it could be something grand in the body of Christ. Always remind yourself as that passage Philippians, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen. Amen. Father, I thank you, Lord Jesus, for the people of God. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for their love. I thank you, Lord, for their faithfulness. I thank you, Lord, for their commitment, Lord Jesus. Father, we are just ordinary people, Lord, but because you have come into our lives, we become extraordinary people, Lord, able to do great and mighty things for your kingdom, Lord. I pray, Lord Jesus, that your Holy Spirit in us would compel us, Lord. I know you're going to speak to us this week, Lord. I know you're going to tell us, Lord, that all the things that you have already spoken to some of us, Lord. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you make it clear to us what you would have us to do in your kingdom. There are so many things to do in the body, Lord. And Father, I would pray, Lord, that all these things, Lord, that you have placed before our hearts, Lord, will be the desire. Will be that desire that we say, all I want to do is please my God. So, Father, thank you, Lord. If there's anybody here, you say, Pastor Ben, I've never given my life to the Lord. I've never invited Jesus Christ into my life. I've never had an encounter with God. If that's you this morning, if you've never invited Jesus Christ into your life, I want you to know something. God has been speaking to your hearts from the time you decided to come to church. 